This will be an attempt to summarize the story of the island, because I am not above capitalizing on what will hopefully be increased interest and popularity of the ARC notes after voice notes are added. While the only voice notes are Helena and Rockwell's, I have to include the other characters' notes as well, because they are all intertwined in a way that would make the story incomplete if I were to leave them out. Many of these notes are happening at the exact same time, but the characters are doing separate things, so the island was complicated to explain in a way that would be in a chronological order, but also not be rapidly switching between stories. Which is why I have been avoiding summarizing the arc story, even though it has been something I've wanted to do. But I will be using this document, of all the notes in order, created by a Reddit user whose account has since been deleted. I'll be using a similar order, except grouping some of the beginning notes together, and spending more time with each individual character until they all meet. This is not intended to be a replacement for reading the notes. I may leave out some parts. This is only going to be a brief summary. It will include spoilers, so I would also recommend reading the notes for yourself first, since they are short and really good. Each character has their own writing style, and while I sometimes find first person awkward to read and write, it's done really well here. And my summary will not be able to include those writing differences that give each character their own personality and voice. Just consider this the discount version of the notes, I guess. I'm mainly doing this because I want to talk about the notes and this seems like the best way to do so. I cannot stress this enough, go read and experience the notes for yourself before this. They aren't too long and a summary isn't necessary to understand them. I'm just making this because I think it might be fun. The notes are basically a short book and it might take less time to read them than to watch this depending on how long it ends up being. The story starts with our first character, Helena Walker, a biologist from Australia in the 21st century. Helena was also the one who wrote the dinosaur dossiers for the story maps. She and her tamed Argentavis Athena are flying above the island, mentioning the beautiful sunrise and explaining how lucky she is to be studying the animals on this island as they were previously thought to be extinct. Dinosaurs such as the Brontosaurus, as well as other extinct creatures such as mammoths, dodos, and trilobites all live together with humans on this strange island. There's also animals like otters, leeches, sheep. Not only are there creatures from different times, all the people seem to come from different places and time periods. Helena finally decides to study the island's tundra. She had been waiting for a change in the weather but it did not happen. One interesting thing to note is that she says, clearly this planet has no axial tilt and therefore no seasons, meaning she assumes that she is on a different planet and one without seasons. She notes that the cold climate of this region of the island is strange because many of the animals elsewhere come from the Jurassic and Cretaceous time periods where the climate is uniform and if you look at the tundra in-game, there really isn't much of a transition between biomes. Green forests on one side, and snowy tundra on the other. Helena finds the howling wolves who have taught her about the region and its animals, but then decides to go study them by herself, so that she can see how they act when undisturbed. She is observing a herd of mammoths while writing the dossier when a Tyrannosaurus attacks them. Surprised to see it in a cold environment and not affecting the ecosystem of the tundra in any way, she asks the howling wolves if this is normal. They say it is. Helena notes that all the predators in this region have similar diets and hunt the same prey, which would affect the populations of the species, but here it is not. This place continues to become stranger and stranger. The creatures are from a time that was long after the dinosaurs, and this place has an unusual climate when compared to the rest of the island, and the ecosystem isn't changing even though it should be. After reviewing her notes, she realizes that there are more predators than prey on the island, which isn't how an ecosystem should be. She wonders if the island's environments are being monitored and curated, especially considering the addition of humans on the island too. It is here where she mentions speaking to Rockwell, another one of our main characters. Rockwell, at one point before these notes, gave Helena her Argentavis. She has wanted to repay him, but he said their conversations were enough. 
She wants to remember to collect floral samples from the tundra for him. Helena never thought this island was normal, mentioning the massive floating obelisk. She also mentions a cave with a platform similar to those at the obelisk, except for oddly shaped holes carved in it. But she didn't care about that, since she thought she had a unique ecosystem to study. But now she is having second thoughts about how natural the island is. But she won't give up on this idea of a paradise until she speaks to Rockwell about it. Who is Rockwell? He's a chemist from London in the 19th century, describing himself as a stupendous scholar and explorer extraordinaire in his first note. The note gives readers a look at his personality, one of the examples of the writing making it clear that you are reading an explorer's journal, as well as an interesting way to show his personality. He says that if you found his journal, either then he's met an end on the island, or that you've stolen it, and you should be ashamed, or that he's misplaced it and so you should return it to him. This diary belongs to Rockwell, but with more words, as he usually does. While Helena was having her adventures, Rockwell was having his own. He studies the flora of the island and is amazed by it. As a chemist, he creates many different things with it and has written the recipes you can find in games. One he has created, the Mind Wipe Tonic, does exactly what it says on the tin. Erases someone's memories. He says that his colleagues in London would have laughed at him if he told them that it was possible. But on this island, it is. Many leaders of the tribes on the island offer him riches for samples of the tonic or even the recipe itself. But that does not interest him. He has their protection and plenty of supplies and time for his research. He has this protection because he is seen as a neutral entity on the island and is well respected for that. He often has to negotiate, which annoys him. The black thumbs and painted sharks are disagreeing. The painted sharks sunk two of the black thumbs barges, so they are mad. But the sharks claim that they were too close to Southern Haven and therefore they could sink them according to the Southern Isles Accords. Rockwell just wishes he could mind wipe them and continue his studies. Rockwell considers siding with the painted sharks because they brought fresh fish, very unbiased of him. However, we never find out what his final decision was. Rockwell wants to test his tonics and considers them useless without testing. He has been testing them on Mesopithecus, small monkeys, but is unable to persuade anyone that he needs to test them on humans during stages that are safer. He declines the Laughing Skull's offer because he's a guy with good morals and only wants willing participants who understand the risks. But also he regrets declining, so maybe not. This is the point where Rockwell and Helena's stories combine. Helena visits Rockwell to ask him about her theory, and Rockwell says how much he enjoys Helena's visits and being able to discuss the Ark's ecosystem. And he is one of the ones who knows it is called an Ark, which is explained at some point in Scorched Earth. He says that Helena is an intellectual colleague who shares his love for science, and he wants to create a scientific utopia on the Ark, and find others who think similarly. Helena describes him as having excitement for his work even though he has had a lot of experience. Rockwell assured her that she was just jumping to conclusions, and that the island can still follow scientific laws, just not the ones they're used to. After all, science is about discovery, and new discoveries can invalidate old principles, she says. She needs to gather more evidence, or else she isn't a scientist. There's still two more characters who have been having their own shenanigans while this was happening. Mei Yin Li, an ancient Chinese warrior around the Three Kingdoms era and the Yellow Turban Rebellion, wakes up on the island. She wonders where she is and how she arrived, but she also tells herself that the answers to these questions do not matter and cannot save her. The question that matters the most to her now is how can she survive? She thought her fear died with the yellow turbans, but that changed when she first saw a dinosaur, which she calls a great lizard. She is able to make clothes and weapons, a spear that she uses to hunt the dodos on the beach, and arrows for lizards with fans. Dilophosaurus. She realizes that she is not the only one on this beach after finding footprints. In her past, she defended her hometown from the uprising, which taught her things that she could use to survive on the island. The footprints belonged to three people who tried attacking her when they saw her. However, she killed them and realized that the beaches were no longer safe. The animals were dangerous and not everyone was friendly. 
In order to survive, she had to go to the jungle. She found a small village being attacked by a person riding a raptor. Unable to ignore the slaughter that was happening, she surprised the person, killing the raptor and then him. She realized that she should have spared the raptor, but the villagers who had survived let her have the raptor rider's armor and weapons and let her stay for the night. They said the reason why everyone on the island could understand each other despite speaking different languages was because of the metal object in their wrist, in-game known as a specimen implant. She dreamed about the uprising, but this time she was lifting the siege on her village. However, once again, she was alone as the villagers left before she woke up. She attempted to tame one of the lizards the villagers called Raptor. She knocked him out with arrows covered in toxins and fed him meat. When he woke up, he did not continue to attack her. She noticed that he was all black except for his white shins and feet. She named him, saying that she believed he would carry her home, even if she did not believe in fate. <laughs> she later tamed five other raptors who she taught to follow her own and hunt with him attacking and retreating at her signal. However, they were all she had. She has few possessions, but realizes that she can trade with others. Some are good at crafting, but not fighting. One of her attempts at this went well. Defending some people from the Red Hawks, they relied only on force. She was rewarded with weapons and supplies, as well as unspecified pack animals to carry them. Her skills improved during each battle, but her ranks only grow with animals. She doesn't mind, the people that she cares about are at home. Until she can return, her raptors are enough company for her. Her next mission, she was told, would be dangerous, defending a convoy as they were traveling. However, she did not expect to fight an organized army. When she saw them, she told the convoy to go a different direction, attacked them, and then retreated. While it cost her some of her raptors, both she and the convoy were able to survive this encounter with the army which few are able to do. The army was known as the New Legion, and they were different from most because they had discipline. The last character is the leader of this New Legion, Gaius Marcellus Nerva, a Roman centurion who served in the Roman Republic and Empire during its conquest of Dacia. After arriving on the island, he was disgusted by how chaotic it was. The animals, even when tamed, are not supposed to be civilized. But the people here fight viciously and constantly. He began to lead a small group and train them to fight. He ends every note with the quote, victory through discipline. He remembers his time commanding his soldiers. He had to earn their trust because they questioned why someone so young led them into battle. He says, without discipline, our century's formation would crumble and the legion would be exposed. It is the same here. He wants this island to know Rome's might he is more patient since fighting in Rome. It became easier once his soldiers could see the results of training, and they became very enthusiastic. Nerva found a flag flying above the armory, one that showed the symbol of the Imperial Legion, except with one of the island's pterosaurs on it, along with words that read, the New Legion. One interesting thing to note is that Nerva himself could not read what was written on it. So while the implant translates spoken word, it does not translate written words. Their first battle was successful. It was against somewhat successful raiders, but they quickly became unorganized. The new legion had arrived and was growing quickly. Nerva was intelligent and he made strategies to ensure their victory. He needed to find a way to defend his fortress from those who attacked with flying creatures. He realized that they were no different from any other enemy and instead of blocking them, he just had to control their actions. He created what appeared to be holes in their defenses to attract them into kill zones. Their fortress was growing larger, and they had to prepare for their first true war against the Black Thumbs. Nerva begins to learn how to use the weapons of the island and says that they are only as effective as their wielder, and that essentially the Black Thumbs aren't very good at using them. His strategy was to have them attack disposable animals before attacking with their main force. The difference between the two armies being that the New Legion's attacks are concentrated and well-planned. While the New Legion won, the Black Thumb's leader was not willing to give up. 
However, the others saw their defeat was inevitable, offered the Legion their leader's head, and surrendered. This is Nerva's destiny. He is here because the gods want him to bring order to the island, and to save them from their savagery. The gods lent him strength and pulled him across space and time, and now he will create an empire in their name. According to the wiki, his name means the rejoiced strength of Mars, the Roman god of war, which is very fitting. He allows his legion to rest because they need time to plan and to regain strength, reminding himself that he should not rush into battle. He also needs more information. He has scouts making maps and looking for anyone who could be considered a threat. He wants to be prepared. However, comfort breeds complacency, as he says, so he leads the army on raids of small villages and convoys, enough to give them a challenge. He also lets them keep the spoils of these raids to raise morale. Because of this, many are avoiding the territory of the new legion. To him, this is a good thing. He wants others to be afraid, and they have good reasons to be. This is when they encountered the convoy. They were attacked by a pack of raptors, but once they were able to chase them away, the convoy was gone. Nerva only saw one rider and promises that he won't be unprepared again. Meanwhile, Rockwell recommended that Helena study the marine life of the island with the painted sharks. Thinking that studying a separate ecosystem will help her understand the mainland's ecosystem. Also, after so long in the tundra, the weather of the beach is welcome. The sharks welcomed Helena after she showed them Rockwell's letter of recommendation. In the ocean, there are also more predators than there are prey. There are many megalodons, which are extremely aggressive and territorial, which is unusual for sharks. She also studied the mating behavior and birth of megalodons, learning that they have a gestation period of one week, which explains why their population is high. She wants to compare them to tamed megalodons, and taming them is surprisingly easy comparing them to dogs, which is also unusual for sharks. While sharks can be trained, they can't be trained this easily, and you can't ride one like a jet ski, as she says. She wants to have an open mind, but she is becoming more skeptical. And then she finds them, the Procoptodons, kangaroos that shouldn't be on the island. And this is when she realizes that the island isn't an ecosystem, it's a zoo. Rockwell went on an expedition to White Sky Peak to gather ingredients for his recipes, floral samples, and woolly rhino horns. He even found volunteers for his experiments, and he found them in a perfectly moral and ethical way, of course. Actually, he found that by calling it experimental food instead of experimental potions, people are less wary of trying it. So his endothermic paste became fryer curry, and then everyone wanted to try it. However, he is disappointed that he cannot begin immediately, since it is a difficult journey back to Rockwell Manor. With the help of these people, whose numbers have suspiciously dwindled over time, he is able to find other uses for his fry -a curry. For example, he found that it can lower the metabolism. Rockwell began to look for more volunteers. Why does he need more? What happened to the others? Perfectly moral, you say, Rockwell. He can make something to help with surviving in extreme heat as well. He assumed they'd be willing to help him after he's helped them so many times. But no. They have a favor to ask. They want him to negotiate with Nerva. May questions if she is a mercenary. She doesn't like the title, but was recently called one. She wonders if what she is doing is different. She's fighting for what she needs to survive, and mercenaries fight for riches. At home. She knew who her enemies were and who she was fighting for. On the island, it is more difficult to tell. She tries to be honorable by defending people, but how does she know if she's defending the right people? I cannot dwell on it. To survive, I must fight on. To return home, I must fight on, she explains. She realizes she needs stronger and larger creatures. So she tames some that she describes as large raptors with horns on their foreheads, most likely Carnotaurus. She soon learns that she is living on an island, one that she considers cursed. She tamed a giant raptor, probably the rex, and a spine lizard, most likely the spinosaurus. After that, she tried to find a way home, but she was told that there was a barrier that keeps people from leaving the island. 
there is no way for her to return home. She is not alone, as she has her raptor who can sense that she is uneasy. The Golden Arrows proposed a trade agreement between them and the new Legion. This agreement also meant that the Legion could never encroach on the territory or convoys of the Golden Arrows and their allies. While Nerva is not interested in trade agreements, he sees this as an opportunity. He does not agree to it immediately, but suggests that he should meet with their leaders on a neutral site, and he will agree to it then. Of course, that is not what he really plans to do. The new Legion needs to resume its march, and Nerva needs to achieve his goal. News of his response to their trade agreement, presumably killing their leaders, spreads quickly. But no one does anything to act on it. The new legion grew significantly without the arrows, and now the other tribes are cowering. But they eventually sent Rockwell. Nerva heard that he was respected as a neutral party and expert on the island, but Nerva was skeptical. Rockwell thought the other tribes' report on Nerva was exaggerated. He thought that Nerva was intelligent, honest, and even had the right opinions on the island's politics. He sees the conflict as pointless. It won't harm his research, and so he does not care and won't interfere. Nerva was surprised by Rockwell's knowledge of the island, and learned important information about the island, which Rockwell called the Ark. He sends a scout to find where Rockwell lives, since he wants to keep the recipes Rockwell makes out of his enemy's hands. Helena thought that the island was a utopia, but after discovering it isn't natural, she thinks differently. She learns about the new legion trying to conquer all the other tribes, and worries about the effects of this war on the ecosystem, regardless of whether it is natural. But, as she says, nothing can change how beautiful the sunrises are. The leaders of various tribes have banned their members from participating in Rockwell's experiments, after what happened with his battle tartar and shadow steak saute experiments. They experienced periods of withdrawal, but he thinks the benefits outweigh that, since they give people superhuman abilities. They only focus on the negatives, and Rockwell thinks that they're short-sighted. Isabel, a chemist and one of Rockwell's assistants, makes Rockwell go on vacation. Rockwell says that Isabel sometimes knows his moods better than he does, and that the adventure could be good for him. He decides to explore a northern cave. He finds a strange artifact unlike anything he's ever seen before, but he doesn't know what it does. It's pulsing with energy, and he wonders if there are more. He discovers that the podium at the base of an obelisk responds to the artifact when it is nearby. He notices how similar they are, and realizes that they were most likely created by the same culture. However, there are no other signs of this civilization besides the artifact and the obelisk. Who would go to a remote island, build giant sky towers, throw some shiny things into caves, and then leave? May was hired by a fisherman, who called her the Beast Queen of the Jungle, which just made her laugh. When she discovered that she couldn't return home, she found a permanent place to live, and locals know that is where her animals hunt. Still, she wouldn't consider herself a queen, but to her, it is better than being called a mercenary. She thinks back to her past life and what her father would think of her. He trained her in secret because he wanted a son. She wonders if he would be proud of her now. She knows her mother wouldn't approve, because her mother never forgave her for joining the fight but the other villagers did not care. During one of her attempts to tame giant raptors, she saw a beast that she knew she couldn't command. She called it the Demon King. Helena can't stop thinking about the tamed megalodons. She compared them to stray dogs as if they had a genetic history of being domesticated. So she wants to study domesticated creatures because she has mainly studied them in the wild she has heard rumors of someone who has tamed a bunch of creatures and may have useful information. Helena arrives at May's camp. She is surprised that Helena is there to study her creatures. At first, she told Helena to leave because she did not trust her intentions. Who would spend time on things like that in such a dangerous place? May was eventually convinced that Helena was telling the truth, but she doubts her decision because of Helena's strange questions about her creature's feces and mating behavior. 
Helena had gotten used to being known as an associate of Rockwell, and supposes she should have known that someone called the Beast Queen wouldn't welcome her immediately. However, she hasn't told her dinosaurs to kill her yet, so yay? It's difficult to study the dinosaurs with someone glaring at her the entire time, though. There are no differences in the diet of the tamed animals and the wild ones. However, May regularly takes some hunting, and strangely there is always enough prey nearby, despite the increasing number of tamed creatures. Most interesting to Helena is that her creatures never fight, despite the fact that there are many different species living together. Helena and May are starting to get used to each other's company. Rockwell has studied the artifacts, and obelisk, as much as he could. But he still wants to know if there are more artifacts in caves elsewhere. Although he does not want to search in all the caves by himself. Maybe there is someone else who has already found more. After many days, he found the Iron Brotherhood, who have three artifacts similar to his. They agree to tell him about their findings in exchange for his own artifact. Now he can return to his studies and they can look for artifacts. However, he is finding it difficult to remain excited about his usual studies and experiments. Although they have gone well recently, he is frustrated that he can only test his Lazarus chowder on Mesopithecus. He wanted his assistants to participate, but Isabel said it would be too much work for them. He was able to trade his recipes for tame Gigantopithecus, and they did not question if it was tested on humans. He supposed that if they returned with more Gigantopithecus, then it wouldn't be deadly. Meanwhile, Isabel creates air freshener because now the manor smells like apes. The painted sharks doubted that Rockwell would be able to convince Nerva to stop trying to fight everybody. So they decided to attack some of the Legion's coastal fortresses. Nerva noticed that they only attacked from the air and the sea, never from land. So his strategy was to pull the coastal forces back and attack outposts on the mainland, to cut their fortress on an island off from supplies. May and Helena are talking about cooking and other normal things now. They aren't good at it, but they have managed to make something better than plain meat. Soon Helena will have to leave and May learns of the war that is about to happen. Helena realizes that the animals are used to humans. Her theory is that the ecosystem is artificial, the animals are genetically modified, and their populations are being controlled. But before she talks to Rockwell about this, she wants to confirm a rumor. A member of the Painted Sharks was sent to hire May. However, they are fighting the new Legion. Although May has grown stronger since their last battle, so has the Legion. However, the Sharks were desperate, and so she agreed. She remembered the dream she had when she first arrived on the island of how she lifted the siege on her village. Maybe that was what she was meant to do here. During the battle, May's beasts caused the new legion to flee, and she wonders if the emotions she felt during this moment would be what returning home would feel like. Nerva heard reports of the beast queen joining the sharks, recognizing her as the person who defended the convoy. She caused the new legion to retreat for the first time, and Nerva cannot allow this to happen. Rockwell is losing excitement for his research. He thought his adventure in the caves helped, but it did not. It was actually the problem. He always wants to discuss the obelisk, even when he does not want to do research. He says, there is a certain allure to them that I cannot describe, something that causes my thoughts to drift in their direction, like the pull of a strong tide. Meanwhile, Helena has found what she was looking for, an island with only carnivores known as Dead Island in the game. This island does not make sense, the carnivores could not maintain their population on such a small island. They have little food and they couldn't survive by only eating each other since carnivore meat is more likely to carry harmful parasites. Someone had to put them there on purpose. She knows that now, Rockwell can't deny her theory. Nerva learns that May is only a mercenary, not part of any tribe, so he does not need to defeat her, even though that would be satisfying for him. He only needs to separate her from her employers. In battle, the painted sharks cheer for her, but they never speak afterwards unless they are talking about battle plans. May has a separate camp and does not understand why they rarely talk. She knows it is difficult to trust others on the island, but she has helped and fought with them, and her animals have died in this war. 
But soon they will win, and the sharks will trust her after that, and now they are going to Legion territory. Rockwell is excited to see Helena, the only person he feels comfortable talking about his deeper theories with again. While they talked, Rockwell kept talking about the obelisk and the artifact, giving Helena very little time to discuss her theory. Rockwell couldn't deny it, but he also didn't seem too interested. After his next set of trials, he is going to check on the Iron Brotherhood and convince Helena to join him. She thinks that the obelisk could be linked to her findings since they have always been a mystery. Helena visits the Iron Brotherhood, but they weren't too happy to see her. Especially after she mentioned Rockwell, surprisingly. There it was gloomy and deserted, and their leader was on a hunting expedition. She was waiting for him to return. They gathered all the artifacts and activated an obelisk, but they weren't celebrating their discovery. After activating it, they found another artifact, but the Brotherhood doesn't want it because it apparently had no use, and they only got it after defeating a giant spider. So it reminds their leader of those who died to get it. They gave it to her and she figured it couldn't be useless. Nothing happened when she took it to an obelisk, but she remembered the platform in the cave she found. It was similar to the obelisk platform, so it was worth a try. May was angry, so angry that even her raptor kept his distance. The new legion attacked the painted shark's camp during the night, and when May rushed to help them, the sharks panicked and attacked her dinosaurs. They both sustained losses, and the painted sharks blamed her for it. Some of them even claimed she set their camp on fire, and she wonders why they'd question her after all she's done for them. The new legion planted explosives in the painted shark's camp, leaving hers untouched. Now that she is out of the conflict, the war will end quickly. Nerva pushed the sharks out of his territory and soon will face them in the open sea, where the sharks are the strongest. The sharks told May that they would finish the war without her, so she left. She doubts that they could, but cannot protect them if they don't want it. She wonders if the new legion will find her next, and if they do, she knows she will not receive any help. Her own strength is insufficient, and she needs the demon king. The legion took the sharks last foothold on the mainland. The war has become a war of attrition. Nerva constructs a fleet while the painted shark's resources dwindle. The new legion's flyers harass their main compound while Nerva plans their invasion. He finds out that some sea creatures can have a ballista platform on their backs and hopes he gets a chance to use them. Eventually, the sharks were defeated and the legion raised their flag above the shark's fortress. While Nerva let his troops rest and celebrate for a few days, he did not rest. He will only rest once he has brought the island into a new age. Meanwhile, May found the Demon King. Taming him was difficult. He killed many of her raptors, but she was able to succeed. She tested his hunting skills while riding one of her flying creatures, a wise choice. Since, after falling down a rock formation, his eyes glowed, and he would not listen to her. After the dinosaur was calm, she realized that she had to be more careful. Her other animals have been tense around him, so she kept him away from them. Helena finds out that the artifact she got from the Iron Brotherhood fits one of the slots in the platform she found in the cave. Apparently, it is a key, and she should be able to obtain the other two keys by activating the other obelisk. She thinks that the platform could lead to the thing controlling the ecosystem. Before activating the other two obelisks, she has to find a bunch of artifacts, which she can't do alone. Rockwell's trials for his Broth of Enlightenment have concluded, and he is disappointed, just as he expected. He tested it on primates, and while their ability to learn increased, they did not ascend to a higher level of intelligence. He is planning an expedition to visit the Iron Brotherhood, and is preparing a letter to send them when he leaves. Then he is interrupted. Nerva is there, and he wonders why. As soon as Nerva's scouts reported that they had found Rockwell, he had to visit, even if it meant letting others do things that were more important. He wants Rockwell as his advisor. Even if Rockwell doesn't accept his offer, Nerva's visit was still beneficial. Nerva learns that Rockwell has theorized that the obelisks are powerful. Nerva wonders if he can use that power, so he wants to learn all he can. Rockwell has always been neutral in political matters and has wanted to remain neutral, but Nerva's offer was tempting. And he found Nerva to be respectable. Nerva even offered to provide test subjects and expressed interest in the obelisk. 
and all he wants in return is reliable counsel. While he would trust few to keep those promises, Nerva's new legion is the most powerful tribe on the island, and eventually, the only powerful tribe on the island. It is worth considering. Nerva is fascinated by the obelisk, and how Rockwell was able to get one to respond to an offering. To Nerva, they are a monument to the gods, and if he appeases them with a sacrifice, they could give him their power. He will pass this trial and command the power of the gods. Rockwell chooses to accept Nerva's offer, even though the Legion is not beloved by many. If he wants to continue his studies, he must be on the right side of history. He has to wait to study the obelisk while he travels with Nerva to take care of some matters of foreign policy. So he left Isabel in charge of Rockwell Manor. Few tribes remain that can resist the new legion, the exception being the Howling Wolves in the Tundra region. They are good fighters, and an invasion in that weather would be impossible. He chooses to avoid them for now, hoping the obelisk could solve his problem. Rockwell hasn't been entirely truthful about them. He knows that they would be more useful to Nerva as weapons, and so he makes sure to mention that possibility. It's not like he's lying. He doesn't have any evidence that they could be used as weapons, or any evidence of the contrary. If this will convince Nerva to go to the obelisk sooner, so be it. Nerva remembers his time in Rome. While his hometown in Numidia had wonders, it cannot compare to Rome. He wanted the new legion to have a capital to reflect that splendor. Most on this island are consumed by the present, their immediate needs and struggles. Yet a new generation will live within our walls one day. When they see what their forefathers have built, I want them to be inspired as I was. I want to show them that no matter where they are born, their destinies are theirs for the taking. Here, Nerva explains his motivations. This, I think, is one of the most interesting parts about his character. At this point, at least, he seems to have good intentions, although his actions of trying to conquer everything are wrong, and these intentions do not justify this. Helena needed help finding the artifacts, so she asked the Howling Wolves, but would not go any further. They had heard what happened with the giant spider and the Iron Brotherhood. Helena understands, but is concerned. She could not win a fight with a giant spider. Even with Athena, she preferred to avoid danger. She needs backup. And also Chili. Nerva received news that the Beast Queen has returned with even more creatures, and she is traveling to an obelisk. He cannot think of anything worse than that. While she has been a nuisance before, with the power of the obelisk, she would pose a threat to everything he has built. So, he mobilizes his main force to intercept her. Rockwell is glad they are finally leaving. He noted the lack of decorations at their compound, which makes him miss the manor. While he learns of the Beast Queen, Rockwell is not concerned. No one could uncover the secret of the obelisk alone, but she wasn't alone. May wonders if she is making a mistake the closer she gets to the obelisk. Helena did not know how it would behave, but if it was like the other, it would transport them to a place where they will have to battle a monster for a key. There is a chance that this could be her way home, or at least away from the island and the new legion. Helena has hired her, but this is payment enough. And then there was the giant ape. May was only able to defeat it with the Demon King's strength. She was glad she did not leave him behind. While his rage cost her the lives of some of her animals, that was the price of victory and the price of hope. Helena found the second key and decided to look around before returning. She wonders how the ape survived in an isolated environment. It lived there or was released when they arrived. It could be useful in figuring out how the island's ecosystem worked. The key matches the one Helena already has, so the third obelisk must have the third key. May wonders what will happen after. Could the combined power of each obelisk take them anywhere, and could it even take them home? Nerva was afraid that he arrived at the obelisk too late, but then there was a bright flash of light, and May, Helena, and their army of creatures were in front of them. Battle began as soon as they appeared. Nerva noticed that her new dinosaur attacked both allies and enemies. Soon. Her animals were dead, and she had fled with mortal wounds. They had also captured an acquaintance of Rockwell's, Helena. Nerva wonders if she knows something about the obelisks that Rockwell does not. From May's perspective, the new legion were cowards. They attacked when the creatures were exhausted and not at full strength. 
Before she could retreat, the Demon King raged and all hope was lost. The last thing she remembered was a sharp pain in her side. When she awoke, she and her raptor were alone. Both were wounded, but her raptors were worse. He had carried her to safety, and now they must hide. Rockwell was absolutely astonished, shocked, and flabbergasted. Why was Helena investigating the obelisk with May, without notifying him? How dare she do things by herself after he treated her with such respect? Unfortunately for her, Rockwell is always one step ahead. He can combine the knowledge she has with his own, and she will never know. He can keep his presence a secret, since she has no idea he is working with Nerva. Helena's first impression of the Legion wasn't a good one. She and May weren't the closest of friends, but it was still hard to watch her creatures get slaughtered. Nerva introduced himself. He let her keep her things, and their conversations have been civil, though that could change if she didn't cooperate. Though they already took the keys, and this is her only chance to see what the platform does. May and her raptor were attacked by much larger creatures, and with his wounds, they were faster too. He died saving her one last time. She had lost her closest friend and promised to avenge him. She blamed the new legion and swears to find their leader. While Helena had warned Nerva of the monster that they would have to defeat after activating the obelisk, he did not expect a dragon. It cost the lives of many of his men, but they defeated it. It was worth it. The third key would allow him to open the cave. The power of the obelisk and the island will be his. Before this, Rockwell would have doubted the idea of a device that could transport someone from one place to another. But that is what the platforms did. The dragon was trivial compared to the possibilities of that. He assumes that it's just the beginning of what they are capable of, and he must learn more. When Nerva returned with the third key in the head of a dragon, Helena described him as having a tangible ego, and she is irritated by this, and how he considers himself to be Jupiter's gift to the island. Nerva's overconfidence is becoming more apparent, and while she wants to see him fall flat on his face, she still needs him and the new legion to find out what is in the cave. So, she will guide him to the cave, unsure of what he will decide to do with her afterwards. I would like to point out something that I've noticed and can't stop thinking about. The keys are not an actual item in-game. You use the trophies you get after defeating the boss, their heads, to unlock the cave. But those couldn't realistically be used in keys as they are not similar in appearance to the artifacts. And the line, the third key in the head of a dragon, could imply that they are separate items. Of course, it could also mean that there was one item that was both the key and the head of the dragon. But Helena mentioned that she had found the key after defeating the Megapithecus, and that they were described as being guarded by the monsters. Also, it would just be inconvenient to carry three massive creature heads. Why they aren't in the game, I have no idea. The other tribes on the island have noticed that since the main army of the new legion has left, their territory is less defended. Seeing this weakness, They've been raiding the New Legion's camps. And with all the recent battles, Nerva and his army have been distracted. Nerva decides to ignore them, and to let them have their victories for now. They will pay once Nerva has the power of the obelisk. Rockwell is annoyed by how impatient Nerva is. He had very little time to study the obelisk before they left for the cave. He wonders if Nerva thinks that Helena knows more about the obelisk than he does which to him is nonsense. He is Nerva's advisor, after all. He still feels that he has to prove he is the superior scientist. He will be the one to discover the cave's purpose. As he says, the mysteries of the obelisks are mine to uncover, not Miss Walker's or even Mr. Nerva's, mine. May, still seeking revenge, found the Legion at the last obelisk. Once they left, she followed them. There were too many for her to fight, and she has to make sure that they do not find her. But she knows how to hide from them. She was able to figure out who the leader was from the way he walked. In her words, no one else walks with his pride or gestures with his authority. She thinks that she could have hit him with an arrow, but she wanted him to see her face and know it was the Beast Queen who vanquished him. Nerva's men are uneasy. The Howling Wolves are headed for New Legion territory. Many want to return, but Nerva says they lack foresight, and only Rockwell understands his plan. They've arrived at the cave, and once he has the power it contains, he will easily defeat the wolves and anyone who opposes him. 
He wants to unite the island. He goes from, I want them to be as inspired as I was, to, soon they'll see, everyone will see. I am this island's destined emperor. I am its destined god. Helena realizes that this might be her last chance to reflect on her experiences on this mysterious island before Nerva returns. If she hadn't sought the truth of this place, this never would have happened. But to her, that would not have been better. And I might as well just read the quote since I think it does a good job at explaining it. I realized that had I just ignored the signs and accepted this paradise at face value, I'd still be happy and free. Would that have been better? I don't think so. After a lot of thought, I've decided that I'd rather die seeking the truth than live in an illusion. That, as Rockwell would say, is the path of a true scientist. Nerva did not expect to find another monster in the cave. This one was more powerful than the others. Yet despite the death of his men and creatures, he was victorious. Rockwell also survived and has never seen anything like this cave. Nerva thinks it is the Hall of the Gods. The power of the obelisk is waiting for someone worthy, someone like him. All he needs to finally achieve his goal is that power, not his creatures, not his men. He gives the gods credit for his victory and for bringing him to this island. Nothing, how can there be nothing? I have searched ceaselessly, and yet I find nothing. While Nerva tries desperately to find what he has been promised, and a way to unite the island, as he assumed the gods sent him there to do, there was nothing. There is nothing left for him to sacrifice, and now all he gets is a view. He doesn't understand why he would be brought here if it wasn't to bring order to the island. Was it a joke? The gods never answered his questions, and now he feels abandoned and betrayed. He is alone. Meanwhile, Rockwell's just going on his own adventures. While Nerva is disappointed, he is impressed by the view from this cave, comparing it to the peak of Olympus. He would sacrifice Nerva's men thousands of times for this. He notes the strange metal the place and the monster is made out of, describing it as similar to the obelisk, but more alive. And so it begins. He wonders if some of the consoles will have more information on the metal, and while he is not familiar with the technology, he figures that he can get it to work. Helena finds out that May wasn't dead. She had arrived at the cave, freed Helena, and insisted they follow Nerva into the cave. May soon regretted that though, as Helena was too distracted by the cave itself. Eventually, they found the aftermath of the battle. Helena was horrified to see Nerva's men dead along with shards of an unknown metal. However, Nerva's body wasn't there. When she saw that, she tried to convince May not to kill him if they encountered him. May knocked her unconscious, claiming that she wished her no harm, but that Helena was in her way. Because punching your friends is the best thing to do in this situation, obviously. Seriously, does anyone in these notes understand the importance of good communication? At least, Helena told her his name before that. May thinks that this is a fitting place for her vengeance. Here, at the edge of heaven, let our battle finally be decided. She assumed that Nerva knew he wouldn't do well in yet another battle. They fought briefly, but after she wounded him, he retreated. She assumes the command center where they fought was created by someone with technology beyond what everyone else on the island had. She could see several worlds floating in space. One she recognized, the island, and many others she didn't. Could Nerva have escaped to one of these other worlds? She won't give up easily. She will find him in whatever world he travels to. This has become something much more personal than just defending others on the island. She finds another terminal on a platform. She wonders if it can allow her to travel to the other worlds. There is a terminal that sits upon a platform near the end of the command center. Surely, through some combination of codes, that must unlock travel to other worlds. But it does not. It only adds another foe to be slain by the Beast Queen. This is the last part of her notes. The note doesn't directly state what happens, so this might be a bit of a spoiler for one of the next parts of the story. It is revealed to be true later on that she does find and kill Nerva at the platform. When Helena woke up, despite searching everywhere, she couldn't find any signs of May or Nerva. All she found was some dried blood. The island was floating outside the window, surrounded by machinery, orbiting the earth with similar stations. 
The entire island was completely artificial. She wondered what it was and why anyone would make it. I don't have the answers to any of these questions, or the dozens of others that keep popping into my head, but somehow, I mean to find out. Somehow, I'll find the truth. The Tech Cave was a mysterious place, often compared to Olympus or Heaven. For Helena, this was the first step to finding the answers that she sought. For Rockwell, the metal it was made out of was fascinating. For May, it was the perfect place for her final battle with Nerva. And Nerva felt betrayed that it didn't have the power he sought. At this point, I am not sure if I want to summarize the next parts of the story. While I planned to summarize both the island and Scorched Earth before the new update was released, that clearly did not happen. And I'm not sure if I want to write another 18-page summary. But if I do make more, I will at least make one for Scorched Earth. Maybe even Aberration and Extinction, since those parts are what I'm most familiar with.